Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, Rock and Roll? Jeff, it's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. Where we talk about all things like music, motivation, success. This stuff drives us. It inspires us. This one's a long time coming. I really relate to this guy. Today's guest, we're we're hypies, man. We do a lot of stuff. Originally from Bellevue, New Jersey. This is the home of Frankie Valley and Joe Pesci. Hey, you think I'm funny? And now calling Whippany, New Jersey, is home. Today's guest, very busy, multitasking drummer, educator, author, and publisher, our friend Joe Bergamini. What's up, Joe? Hey, Rich. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm so honored that you'd ask me to uh, come and talk to you today. We've... Oh, man. You know, I check with everybody on what their intro is going to be and if they approve it because I try to make it as Hollywood as possible. I mean, it's almost like we need a timpani live from Whippany, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll bring in a lot of viewers. <laughs> I love New Jersey. Everyone's like, yeah, which exit? You know, that's the the old running joke. You know? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Jer Jersey is, uh, you know, George Carlin had a thing where he's like, you know, they call it the Garden State. Sure, if you're growing smokestacks, yes. You know, like everyone, <laughs> <laughs> every, every, everyone thinks that, but it's it's beautiful, you know. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, it, when you get to travel a lot like we do, you you, you start to dispel a lot of the uh, – the myths perceptions people have about places you know yeah and there's a there's a lot of those um those little handles that you guys have like the handles on a mug the little oh yeah, yeah it's yeah. like your version of a roundabout it's called the jug handle a jug handle i was like what is this i have never seen this before but at yeah, least gotta, drivers there they know how to handle it we have a roundabout you have the right to go left and stuff you know yeah yeah it, it, it's crazy but no the beautiful thing about new jersey is that you can have a suburban life and you're in very, very close proximity to New York City, which is you know all too well because you have been a – there's so many things you do. and We're going to shine a light on all the amazing stuff you do, but you've played for so many Broadway shows. You first started out subbing, and you've worked with shows like Moving Out, Jersey Boys, Rock of Ages, In the Heights, Beautiful, the Carol King musical, Hamilton, the Lion King, Million Dollar Quartet. It goes on and on. So – you know, you got to go in every day, right? You take a train, yeah, so, you drive. What do you do? How does that work? Sure. So I'm, I'm in a phase now where I'm actually not doing any Broadway. I, I subbed for about 15 years. Um, certainly haven't closed the book on it. And then I got a show of my own. It was called Getting the Band Back Together. So yeah, I, well, you got to develop your own drum parts, right? Yeah, it was, I wrote the book. Unfortunately, the show got bad reviews and it didn't last very long. But um, that, that was a, like, that part, like being in at the beginning and be able to work on designing your own parts and your, your setup – I love that. If I get another chance to do that, that'd be great. Um, subbing only simply because uh, just I'm so busy with other things. And when you sub, you know, learning a book, like, I mean, I usually sit for like hours every day and shed and like, um, but like our good, our good friend, Andres at Hamilton, he's such a beautiful guy. He's like, really wants me to go back to Hamilton. So as soon as I can sub again, I have time. That's where I'm going back, going to go back to. But, um, but I did, I did, uh, you know, like, when I was coming up, you know, you referred to growing up in the shadow of New York City. By by the accident of my birth, I was born near this huge market of music. And yeah. it, was, it was there. You know, I was going in to see shows at Madison Square Garden since I was a kid. You know, I wasn't in the city every day. I mean, I grew up in Jersey. Um, but as soon as I was, like, at the end of high school and in college, I was in bands trying to get signed. I played CBGBs. I played Limelight. I played Dance Theory, I played all the famous rooms in New York City. And... Uh, you know, that that was like, I guess you sort of maybe took it a little for granted that you're, you know, it, and it was still kind of the seat of the, you know, one of the seats of the record business for jazz and rock at that time. And then I, uh, so the session scene started to die out in New York around the time I was becoming a pro and playing Broadway shows, all the best players were playing on Broadway. Like that were New Yorkers. Tommy Igo is it Lion King. Lion you know? King. Yeah. Yeah. Is there now the great drummers there. Um, every, like, so, and I had gone, you know, even as a kid, I had been, I had been to that one, that buddy rich tribute concert that Neil Peart, Will Calhoun, Steve Smith, Martin Smith, Smith played at, at the Ritz. You know, I, you know, a lot of the bands that no one else got to see would come to New York. Like I, I was a, you know, a prog nerd. So I liked the band Marillion because they opened for Rush. Marillion. I remember Marillion. Was that Jonathan Mover? Uh, 
No, he he had the gig for a minute. The drummer's name is Ian Mosley. I'm actually oh. a huge fan of his. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they played the Ritz, you know. So anyway, I remember be, clearly remember being at the Ritz, seeing the Buddy Show, and watching Will Calhoun and Steve Smith and all these guys, and I'd be like, man, all these rock guys play great with the big band. Like, I got to get it together. Like, I want to survive in New York. I got to know all the styles, man. So like, you know, being here, just you know jump started that and i knew i wanted to try to survive in the broadway world because it was like that was where you got tested all the best players went yeah. i i didn't really have a goal to do it but when it, i had the chance to do it i did it and um and last but not least you know i have deep roots here my family's here my wife's family's here and i never had to move i i, I was just by like i said accident of my birth i was born next to one of the major music cities like let's get real you want to have a, a slamming career in this business you got to be in new york la or nashville maybe miami to some small degree like lesser. i, I just i just interviewed lee levin so we know lee from miami he's like 1200 credits i just looked on the muso ai he's 0 0.01 percent of the recording drummers on the on the planet i'm like oh my god so yeah miami it, co it comes up you know it's in the mix but the big three yeah N new yeah. york la nashville crazy were you, were you where were you born i was born in milford connecticut uh actually i was raised in, born in norwich raised in milford connecticut so i'm i'm a canetian and then when i was 11 i moved to el paso texas which worked out nicely because of the music education culture but come on being by new york city you can you can watch the greatest drummers in the world you can play at all the greatest nightclubs in the world you can study with the greatest drummers in the world unbelievable it worked out great for you man i would have to say like when i had my parents were always in my corner um yeah i mean i told the story of my how I got started many times, but I always admired guys like you, man, like to have the, like, it takes big brass ones to up and move. Like I didn't have to move to Nashville or move to LA. I was just here. Like, and I had my parents and I, so I, I had every advantage and I, and it's like, you know, if you, if you have that gift of family support and you're by the city, like you just need to work your ass off. Like, yeah. That's and you did, you were studying, you ended up studying with, uh, our friend Dom Famiolaro, God rest his soul. He was, I know he was a massive teacher, massive mentor, inspiration for you. Um, you know, of course, which we can get in, uh, get into, and I'm sure we will. But yeah, the Broadway thing, I mean, I've interviewed Brian Delaney. I went to school with Brian Delaney, and he was talking about subbing for all these various artists. And he goes, how it, it's very difficult and intense to not only learn the book, um, but to keep everything fresh because you're on call for multiple shows. And it's like, hey, I need you tonight. Oh my God, well, I only have two hours before downbeat oh my god i, I gotta brush this off I you know, know yeah. and and i i interviewed uh marindino and sean mcdaniel and warren odes and some of these guys are like sean's an og uh sean is becoming an og warren is definitely an og and sammy is becoming an og because he was in the he was in the rock and funk world but he's been doing broadway for a decade now yeah and you know it's funny because even within the realm of broadway and I, i'm sure it's like this in nashville maybe to some degree not everybody has the same skill set so if you're if you're right if you're originating a book and you're in there for the dance rehearsals at the beginning yeah and you have the right relationship with the right musical director you might not be a good reader and you could, could probably get by but you know if you go out there's other situations where in rehearsals if they're like you know when i was do you know, in getting the band back together rehearsals, you know, the choreographer or uh, the director would be like, hey, man, you know, our musical director is Sonny Palladino. He's also the musical director of the Duop Project, which is the group I tour with now. Yes. He, um, Sonny would be like, the director would be like, no, we need a little more music there. We need to be a little more exciting. Sonny would be like, okay, um, guys, take the changes from, you know, bar 63. We're going to insert four bars here. I want a fortissimo. Put a big button on the E of three in bar 68. And then we're going to cut to 84. Uh, got that? You know, pencil. Run and then run it. Like, and if you can't survive that, like, if you, if you, it, there are certain situations like that where if you couldn't read, you'd be, um, you know, you'd be canned in a second. So, like, yeah. like uh, I played, I subbed at uh, In the Heights and um, for Andres, and it was all a lot of Afro Cuban music, other styles too. And I had, I had always like had such respect and even fear of playing that music because I just always loved it. And I just was like, man, like here, I'm, I don't want to sound like a gringo, like, you know, when I'm trying to play the clave. Don't flip the clave. They'll take you out back and kick your ass. 
or, or even just <laughs> even just like knowing like what like what other notes to like what when I when I was studying Andres play it because he's such a virtuoso at it I was like okay I can't play everything that he's doing but but I'm not going to play anything that's not in the dialect so I wouldn't play anything that he wouldn't do right. right? And then, and then I subbed a lot, and I became one of the top subs there. And Alex Lackamore, who's now a big star, he was the musical director there. And then Andres couldn't make some session for, like, Broadway does, like, Christmas albums every year. And they had a Latin chart, and, and Alex was like, hey, man, Andres can't make it. Can you do the session for the Carol's for a Cure Christmas album? And I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. Now they find out I'm an imposter. I got to play. You know, but I, I had prepared for that. Like, so here it is now. I'm on a session. And so I, my point is when you're subbing – it's a different gig. It's like being in the most detailed tribute band you could imagine. Like when you're subbing, bro, these people have played the same music every day, eight shows a week, sometimes for years. You come, it's not the place to come in and be like, oh yeah, I mean, check out my interpretation. No of, interpretation. Uh, you're, yeah, no, you, like, you're, you are, you are copying as closely as possible. They don't want to know that the regular guy's not there. That's the job. Okay? That's the job. That's the job. And so, and so then, so that's that job. And, and because the shows are so detailed and let's get real, like right now, they're like in today's Broadway, the drummer can tank the show. Every show's to a click, like you're, it's all groove. It's all modern music. So like you, when you go into sub in the old days, I heard stories like people would go watch the book and read it that night. No, you can't do, they're too detailed. Like you shed for a couple months and then you go in and play. Yeah. So you, you actually don't have to be a great reader because at that point it's prepared reading. It's, it's the, it's the workshops. Yeah they do before and the sessions that come out of it and the other stuff. Um, like I just did a, I just took a, I'll take like gigs like that. Like I took a Broadway in the park gig with all Broadway singers this past weekend. Cause I knew I was going to get there and they were just going to throw up charts. I got some of it ahead of time. I got some of it on the gig and some of it was not even drum parts as piano vocal. Like you don't exercise. I was been talking for some reason, like themes come up with your students. I've been talking about the different ethics of the different gigs. Like on that gig, it was like, you, if you couldn't read, you'd be canned. Like they've called me every year for like three years now. It's like, I love it. And I, I exercise the sight reading muscle there. I'm doing a corporate with some people from Rock of Ages in two weeks. It'll be an, a 90 minute set of 80s tunes. I'm going to, I, on that gig, I'll, I'll be able to use some charts because I know the people, but like you really don't want to use a lot of charts. You're going to be like decked out. You're going to be rocking out. Yeah, like you're those, seen. You're on stage like a performer. So you don't want the neck crane to the left. Yeah, but it's cool. Like, like, like on a Steely Dan tribute gig that I just did. Like you'd agree, like you can have charts on that gig. Like oh that's, a, that's like a music, like, like, okay, cool. Like I'm reading the Asia stuff. Like, but, but when you're playing Jesse's girl or, or Motley Crue, you know, looks to kill with an eighties thing and, you know, girl singers from trans Siberian orchestra, are gorgeous, fucking gorgeous, killing it. <laughs> and that, you could totally do that. No, it's great. Um, great. You know, like amazing. I, I know, I noticed like we make mistakes and we learn from them, right? Like, I've done gigs where like I leaned on some charts and then like in certain worlds, like the rock world, they might be like, Oh, like dude, do, bro doesn't know the songs that well. He's using charts. They don't, they don't like, so, you know, in certain worlds you're like, no, I'm, I'm using a chart so I can nail it, nail the tunes, you know? Yeah. So anyway, my whole point is. Uh, I, I, I agree. I, I love the fact that you get to sight read so often. I'm thinking about just calling up one, a couple of these big bands and, in Nashville that I played with 25 years ago, they, there's the Nashville Jazz Orchestra, the Tennessee Jazz Orchestra, the establishment. And these guys are sight reading all the time. It's like, I want to get that feeling again. It's been it's been a while, you know, but it was something I worked on for so many thousands of hours. And when you do it in real time and it comes off and everyone is happy, there's no greater feeling in the world. Yeah, I, I think big band, I think it's the hardest yeah. of all. Because because you have to you have to. You always have to look into the future when you're sight reading, but with big band, you got to look into the future the most because you're given figures and then you have to actually set the figures up. So you have to look into the future even more in real time. Yeah. In real time. Yeah. But no, um, I, I, I am. I remember going to see Sammy set up for kinky boots and I was so fortunate because I was in New York these two times where I could actually watch that the the dance rehearsals where it was coming together or where they go to rehearse and Cindy had her piano out and there was the dancers there and the director and and Sammy was put helping to put the book together figuring it all out I was like whoa this is the beginning stage and then being able to go up into his cave and see the show and all the pedals and the pads and now whoever subs that gig has got to coordinate all these trigger pedals and Ableton and the 
all these rolling pads, man. Crazy. Oh, yeah. Sammy, Sammy's a good example. I mean, he's, he said, what a, first of all, what a great guy, what a great drummer, but he was, he brings so much to the table with his knowledge of Ableton and all the digital stuff that like, he's running the click. Like you can take this show down if you're subbing for him. Like, oh. you, and, and to be honest with you, man, like it's definitely, th that's, I, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of drummers about it. It's some of the most nerve wracking work you can do. Oh, Mike yeah. Dawson told me that because Mike Dawson from MD was doing some stuff and he's like, I did it. I experienced it. I did a good job. I checked the box. I have no interest in this anymore because it is going to wreck my nervous system. I'm like, so wow. I, I, I definitely, I, I definitely got, I subbed almost exclusively. Like I was doing so much of it and it that did change my mojo. Like I started getting too nervous all the time. And, uh, wow. and yeah, I, to be honest with you, I like, I, I'm, I'm happy to admit it. Like, I, I've like been able to do this really cool reset where like I, I, you know, I needed to, I didn't start playing drums to be under pressure and be nervous all the time. And, and so, and you know, the thing is like, it's a lot of this stuff that we deal with, the demons we deal with like are, are internal, like they're self-driven. Right. So like, you know, I was playing Hamilton and Alex Lacamoire is like calling me the night before, like, Hey bro, I can't wait to play again. And I'm like, Oh no, he thinks I'm going to be good. Like, like even like, like him not, you know what I mean? Like, um, so yeah, that's an, that's a crazy book. Cause I got to see Andres do his clinic at PAS where he had the chart scrolling <laughs> on the big screens. And so, so a guy like him, what you're saying is he's a great reader and he can cover all the styles, but his, he, he's got a bag of understanding the real ethnic stuff. Well, yeah. Well, Hamilton isn't that Hamilton is more of the backbeat R&B hip hop thing, but yeah, he was the drummer at In the Heights, and In the Heights was like a legit like Raúl Agraz on trumpet who played with Celia Cruz and oh, wow. people who played with Tito Puente, you know. And here I, here I, and they're so welcome. Here I am, like, hey, you guys want to play some live music over hey, here? Get like, the Italian guy, yeah, 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 the Italian kid from Jersey, you know. But you know, I did my homework, and um, anyway, it's it's a it's a delicate line to walk because I like I like to play in situations where it matters. I don't, I, you know, not to disparage anybody's gig, but like, you know, I, which I would never do. If you're playing music and you're happy and you're experiencing living inside of a groove with human beings, you're experiencing one of the greatest things you could do on this planet. You know, I feel happy doing it. Nice. But, but I, I, I like a certain amount of like, it's like, I want to survive the city. I want to be able to do that. And I, and I did it. And well, then, I was thinking, like, even in New York City, wedding gigs are intense because you have some of the greatest players in the world that are moonlighting on that job. You're like, yeah, we got the, you know, we got the uh, sax guy from the Rolling Stones, and then over on Keys, we got those, you know, we got this yeah. guy from, the, you know, it's happening, and it's like yeah. you can't. A lot of a lot of great players do club dates here, and I, I did a showcase one at a club at um, one of the private clubs in New York City the other night, and my my band leader. It's funny because. As you like, you know, we know each other a long time. You know, I'm an author and all this stuff. I'm, I'm OCD. You can tell that about me. I grew up playing Rush, like every song, note for note, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and so subbing is kind of like you would think it's like right up my wheelhouse, and it is, and it is. But like when I started playing with Matt Friedman, the guy I play with, he was one of the piano men on the Moving Out tour. Not he came in after the show had uh, reached its near its end on Broadway. I just like now I dig like I go on the gig like I don't even know what's coming, you know. And, and it's a memory check, like, oh man, I haven't played, uh, you know, what, what, you know, whatever, like I haven't played Born to Run in a year, like, and I'm trying to, uh, how, what's coming? Oh yeah, that's coming or, and, and he, and it's cool. Cause it's like, you know, he'll call everything from, you know, sugar, we're going down swinging to like, you know, lovely day to peg to Africa. Like you're playing some great music and Whoa. it's just like Africa now. You know, like he, I love that. I love the like again all these different fun pro situations that are different ones to be like, yeah, can I, can I, can I do that one and not just survive it but have fun and yeah, I guess I'm pretty lucky to be able to. So I mean, so maybe some of your attention to detail and being like a prog rocker and really ad admiring and modeling Neil helped you a lot for Broadway because let's face it, I mean that guy had. Oh, here's the or orchestral ch chime part, and here's the glockenspiel, and, and then I'm over on this trigger pad. And now I got to do it, and I got to hit the splash in the middle. And I mean, that's in that's intense. So you love Neil, so because you were you, that's kind of like you were in several 
tribute bands. Yes, Neil. Oh, Patrick, yeah, I was uh, in Rush. one. So, yeah. so when I was a kid, I I played along to Rush like pretty much. I I used to come home from school and play along to records for like three hours every day, yes. and um and and a lot of it was Rush. Now, luckily for me, and I I didn't I didn't know it was luckily for me at the time. I happened to just dig playing any music that I liked. And so at the time, like I can remember ZZ Top Eliminator was a hit. <clears throat> Night Rangers album, um, Midnight Sister Christian, yeah. Yeah, the one with Sister Christian on it. But like there was other good songs on the record. And that that guy, Kelly Key, yeah, I've always been a fan. He's like tasty, but like cool fills. And then like I was into like Dio. I played along with Vinnie Apsi a ton. Love Dio. The Ozzy records that were out at the time. I definitely, definitely the first couple. But then he, when Randy Castillo was the drummer, I remember I learned every song on the Ultimate Sin, note for note. Randy Castillo, you know? yeah, God rest his soul, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, and Van Halen to a certain degree, Journey, you know. But um, I guess my point with that was, I loved playing Rush, and I did a ton of it, and I was like totally worshipped him. But I'm happy that I, without anybody telling me, I equally got off on playing along to Eliminator where there was no fit, like, I just like dug, if I liked the song, I just would groove and I'd be like, I can't hear the freaking drums on Sharp Dress, man, I'm, I'm in it, man. Yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. yeah and, and, and like, I've, I've given a lot, when I was in the Rush cover band, I, I got a lot of students out of it. Like, you know how many people, a lot of people know what Neil's do. I will always say the analogy, you go to a Rush concert, let's say there's 15,000 people. You're gonna see like 5,000 people air drumming. Out of that 5,000, you probably got a thousand of them who actually kind of know what Neil's doing. Yep. Out of that, you probably have like a hundred drummers who could actually sort of play it. Out of that, you probably have a dozen who can actually really actually play what he's doing in time. Maybe there's a couple of pros that can actually sound sort of like, because they, what happens is people get distracted by all the, the cool stuff that he did, which, which drew in so many people. But they, but they, they missed building the foundation. You know what I mean? So like they're playing along with just these pop tunes. Like I'd play along with, you know, Billy Jean and just be like, this is awesome. And I'm yeah. just like, you know, if I could, if I could like make it so I couldn't hear the drummer, I was yes. down. That's what I tell my students. I'm like, hey, if you can't hear the original guy's kit, or if your drums sound like that guy's drums, you're killing it. Yeah, that's and, the goal. And then with with Neil, like. I didn't know, I, I sort of, I guess I, maybe I knew once I was playing for a couple of years and I, I had taken drum lessons, I knew a lot of it wasn't in four. And I found that, I found this old Rush transcription book. Well, it wasn't old when I was a kid. I found this book and it was too late to play. I would just put on the record and I would just read along. I'd be like, oh, that's what that looks like. Oh, that's in seven. Oh, cool. Like I was planting this seed of like. Being a, again, being a master transcriber. Well, like I, I was like, wow, that's really cool. Like, oh man, like, well, this, you know, whatever song, you know, uh, is not in the book. Maybe I'll try to write that one out. And it was just from my curiosity trying to transcribe. And that, that was, that was my thing. You know, I mean, I didn't get into the jazz greats. I, I never listened to some, one of my high school friends probably tr tried to turn me on to Tony Williams and I, and I, I wasn't ready. You know, I didn't get to that till after high school, you know, but I definitely got into like being able to analyze and wanting to do it. And, um, and you know, I didn't go to school for music. Well, but, and that's what's strange. That's what's strange. That's how you got on my radar, Joe, is that I would just keep seeing your name and the bylines in Modern Drummer Magazine or these transcripts. Of Joe Bergamini, Joe Bergamini, transcribed by Joe. I like, I got to meet this guy. He's, he sounds like a nerd dude like me because, like, when I was in Sky, I transcribed the Shout Out to Devil record, I transcribed the Van Halen record, all the police records by hand. You know, people were in metal bands, you know, with like the, with the hairspray and all. And I was just like, transcribing the stuff and like <laughs> playing along with it you know what i mean it worked out for us but i was, yeah. I was like i gotta meet this guy he's a master trans you get paid to transcribe yeah i mean i i don't do as much of it myself anymore now i know because, i farm it out too <laughs> um but uh yeah i that part of it i i just i was interested in doing and then what you probably saw was <clears throat> in modern drummer i they they had a uh, that rock charts column and he gave it to me to do it yeah. after I, now again, modern drummers in Cedar Grove, New Jersey, I could go to the festival every year. Yeah. And, and then eventually I, you know, just befriended Bill Miller and another guy who died way too young. Uh, I and Bill, Bill gave me a break he, to, to write the book, classic tracks for modern drummer. And, um, 
and then I met Ron Spagnardi through that. And they, they really, they gave me a break, man. And, um, but I, but I had been really into it. And then when I got out of high school, you know, I met Dom and I was studying with Dom and Dom sure. really, like, um, not, it didn't necessarily tell me to transcribe, but he sent me to Al Miller and Al Miller was like a big band drummer on Long Island, a okay. uh, great drummer who was friends with Buddy. And he was the one who filled in what I didn't get from not going to music school. I went, I went to school for architecture. That's a whole nother story, but um, well, your dad said, have a backup plan, right? Like, I mean, yeah, well, see, here's the thing. So like, I didn't know anybody that made it. I didn't know any pro. I, I thought you were like Neil or Randy Castillo. Like that was my dream. You're a rock star where you have a regular job, a re regular job. And there's nothing in between. I didn't know. I didn't know about teaching. Like I, like the dudes who taught me at the, at the, I did have a drum teacher named Tim Solok who, who moved away, but you know, in the back of the music store, I, it never really like occurred to me that I, it would be fun to teach. The, the first two guys didn't really seem like they were having fun teaching me, nor did they ever ask me about, they didn't even know I was playing along the rush for three hours at home. They never asked me anything. They just turned a page in a book. Then yeah. Tim, you know, I finally brought it. Tim lives in Houston. And he's a great player. He, I sort of understood that, that he cared. And he would start like noticing I was doing stuff and he would answer my, I finally felt brave enough to ask him about a rush song, you know, and he, and so I brought one in and he, and he, he guided, you know, well, first I, I, I put it, you know, he put the song on, it might've been limelight and it came to the part where it goes in three, whatever. And he stops it and, and I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I can do that. And he's like, oh, oh. And I played that part. And like, it took like, you know, six parts before he's like, we got to the part that I actually could do. And he's like, oh. And I'm like, yeah, I played all this like every day. And he finally got the, like the idea that I was into it, you know. Yeah. So, but then, but then he moved away and I was kind of upset that he moved away and I never got another teacher in high school. I just played in everything I could do, jazz, band, whatever. But not knowing any pro drummers, I was, I was playing in a battle of the bands with like one of my rock bands locally and a guy who worked for tama drums was a judge his name's al marinaro still a good friend of mine you know it's a lot of italian people in my it's life. a lot of italians in that part of the country i wish i got the last name but i i will tell you this i am part of a italian men's group here we get together once a month and over a five hour period of time we slowly eat non-stop and drink wine <laughs> non-stop for five hours and then at the end we smoke cigars and talk even more and maybe have a little bourbon and it's like a seven hour night and we do it once a month it's so fun so the last time i had a hang at my house and and it's not by like any trying to exclude anybody but it was jason rulo for the x jason gianni and jim mola and me it's like you know, what's going on here? It's yeah. like the five families, you know? Um, so, <laughs> so um, anyway, my, I guess uh, just circling back, I, uh, yeah, so I, I was, I was into that sort of writing and, and reading. And then when I met Dom, he really, the, the guy from Thomas said, you should study with my friend Dom. I did. And then he became really my mentor. And, and then he taught me a lot about the business. He taught me a lot about, he changed my playing. He fixed a lot of bad habits I had. He turned me on to Gad and Cobham and Garibaldi and Tony and all the guys. And then he sent me to his teacher, Al, and Al was the one. He put up like, you got to try and make me sight read the trumpet part while I was playing time. You know Sammy Nestico, like? yeah. yeah. Um, and, then, and then over time, you know, it led to like, getting published, getting the articles of Modern Drummer and then getting the book deal with them. And then I, there was a, the, hang on, check this out. Yeah, you are the author of 15 books, and you have been an editor of many as well. Right. So I, I over, the time, over the time of getting published, this is, by the way, this is the book I had as a kid. There you go. The drum, the drum techniques. Of, I used that book because I had to play Limelight with the students of School of Rock at the Ryman. And so uh, here I am I playing Rush with, you know, 12 year olds, 13 years yeah. old, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> so that, so that there was a Zeppelin book that had, was full of mistakes from the same era. And for Warner brothers, I redid that book. And then this is, it's, it's all tied up together to like going out to Nam. Don would be like, you got to go to Nam. You got to go pace You got to network. And so I just went and met people in the business and like, I could transcribe stuff. I could eventually do it in the computer. And then eventually I started writing about it and I got the chance to do the Zeppelin book. And so I, then I had a couple books out. People start to know there's a guy who can transcribe or whatever, and he's organized. And then I got a gig as the editor for Carl Fisher, as the drum editor for Carl Fisher. Okay. So a guy I knew from the Jersey club scene was a vice president at the company, and I ran into him at NAMM. 
And he's like, we're getting rid of our drum editor, come interview. Like, this is all, you know, this is the kind of stuff that like, I tell the story because like, we both get people like, how do you do it? How do you get a career? You know, that, in music. that is the career. The career is this insane amount of multitasking that you do because you're a Broadway drummer, you're a prog drummer, you're a wedding drummer, you're a session drummer, you're a teacher online, you're a teaching in person, you're doing clinics, you're touring, you're transcribing. It's all, you put it all together and then you have these editing jobs. You know, these are our, your version or our version in this industry of like a corporate job where you're collecting a check to be a editor and to serve a function at this publishing company and then you have right. your own publishing company right so one of the things that i wanted in my career was that um you know i i've, ne I've never done a huge name tour like you've done i i do hope to well i toured the duo project and we play a lot of great places like we, hey i, I see the, i see the venues man there's a yeah. nice yeah. theaters and yeah 100 well, percent. it's a yeah. it's a the people are you know they you know they they talk about the music the people and the money you know oh, yeah. and uh, that 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 group is like the grooves are amazing the musicians are always great we play wonderful places um and the, and i love the guys like family yeah. um you know so so i do that i i and you know we play playing and teaching i built up you know my own teaching business and i and i play luckily on some pretty high level things. And even though I wanted to like do these other things in the business and even though I had those interests and even though certainly I'm not the kind of guy who likes to worry about how I'm paying my mortgage every month, mm -hmm. I'd like to get this other work. I never was willing to give up my freedom and my playing career because I just worked too hard and it's too, you know, I, I couldn't, and, and I had chances to do it. Like modern drummer offered me a job like three times when they were at their height other companies offered me full-time jobs and I never, I never, I was like, you know what? I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I don't want to do that. And I never, I never was in a position that I had to do it. And That's so, great, cause you were making a living playing and doing your own teaching. Right. Work. Right. And then, and, and so, so like I sort of had this energy that was going out to the universe, whatever you want to call it. And so becoming the editor for Hudson music, which is a very small company, it's Rob Wallace owns the company. Yes, we love Rob. And then I'm the editor. Mike Hoff does the uh, the, the digital and all our tech, and Al Giordano runs the back end of the company. So it's like all hands on deck. Small. Everyone does it from home. Like it's perfect. Yeah. I'm like I'm, I, I'm not. You know, I can I can do it from an airplane. I can do it from an airport lounge. I can do it from a hotel. I can do it from here. You know, actually, Air, it's airport lounge. That's kind of bougie, buddy. Nice, <laughs> man. I, I gotta, I gotta get back in the Delta Club, man. <laughs> that's right. Um, but yeah, that that's. But still, and then writing, of course, I still, I had this crazy, good fortune to write books. I started with that Zeppelin book, and then I, when I had that Rush book as a kid, I was like, wouldn't it be great if this was like actually like yeah. had color pictures and like stories and like set diagrams. And then I like made that book with Neil and with Stuart Copeland and with Gad. And now I'm working on another one. I, I'll say it on here. I'm working on one with Billy Cobham now. Nice. He just celebrated 80th birthday yesterday. Yeah, he's he's awesome. So let's brag on you, man. Is this current that you have won four Modern Drummer Reader Poll Awards for your drum books? That sounds about right, yeah. And one of which um, is very new and exciting, and I think everybody has this book now, is the, is the Gad book, man. Yeah. Um, uh, and Gad, we trust. Yeah, let me, yeah. While while we're on the topic, do you mind if I show? Please do. Please show us, guys. I'm gonna hawk my wares. So hawk your wares. Here's the Stuart Copeland one. We love Stuart. It's blue. It's it's a uh, it's sexy, very sexy, very thick. Oh, drumming in the police and beyond. The Neil one is called Taking Center Stage. Love it. Um, these are these are for the you know, are people seeing us or not? Uh, not everybody sees it. A lot of people just hear it, but uh, Joe is basically sitting in his gorgeous home studio and he is showing us all the books that he has written. So, so for those who can't see, it's, uh, these are color photos, set, set diagrams. You don't have to read music to get them and like them. There's music in them, but there's plenty yeah. of other stuff. Um, and then the Gad book, I don't have the, uh, it's a hardcover 
biography of him with transcriptions, which Terry Branham did those. He did a wonderful job. Nice. Uh, and then the, and then there's the, the Gadamitz book too, where you, you were very involved with yeah, that. Yeah. So, one. so all of the big projects from Hudson, I'm the editor. So I got to work with Gad on Gadamitz and I got to work with David Garibaldi on, uh, DG's loops and DG's notebook and Steve Smith with his last book. And the crazy thing about this stuff, the, these guys are so great. They like talk to me like I'm their equal, which I'm not, but they like Gad, especially and Garibaldi. They, they're like, they expect me to play this. They're like, hey, man, have you played this stuff? And like on zoom, Gad was like, <laughs> you know, man, like, how, how's it feel? Like you play, play that, that one for me. I'm like, you want me, you to, want play me to play it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah Rob's there too. Like the boss is there too. Rob's watching, you know, and uh, and Garibaldi too. Like he want, you know, I would play through the stuff. I, you know, I put some of it on social media because it's like, man, thank you. Like I'm getting paid. Don't tell Rob Wallace I'm getting paid for this. Like yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's like taking lessons. It's like taking lessons at Gad. And, no, and it's, Gar it's it's incredible, man. I mean, it's like here I am thinking like you're an editor, which means. Hey, you know, a lot of it probably happens via Zoom, but there's probably situations where you're like, hey, man, come on. I got the guest bedroom here. Come do the thing. We'll do the project. You're hanging with these guys. You know, you're soaking up all the juju and you're you get to ask them all their learn about them as human beings. And I think it's a wonderful job, man. And, and you it's do a cool thing. Yeah. But you, the, the other side of it, though, like as to you, you know, your other pursuits that you have, you yeah. act speak and you you know how to go into a boardroom and, and and talk to a company uh maybe the employees maybe the directors maybe the board directors sure there's things about being an editor that most drummers probably wouldn't like i do the copy editing wasn't trained for it i'm just i guess i'm sort of good at it i'm you know nerdy like that i fix the periods and the quotes i don't always like doing it but i do it because the company needs it done um I, i'm a pretty voracious, voracious reader so i don't mind doing it it's not my favorite thing to do then, you know, we have to think about content. If somebody comes in and it's thin or it's too much, we have to tell them maybe you should leave that out or, or put it in. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, this is, it's a business. So Rob and I are like, we try to really hook people up. Like we, we love, it's still prestigious to be published with Hudson Music or, or you know, a big publisher. And we love giving people that chance, but it's getting harder and like we have to, like my gig as an editor, like I can't, I, I got to try not to bring things in that are going to sell three copies. I have to, you know, they do have to sell. That's we're in a business to sell books. And we. Well, have and to. you guys are very kind to have you. Uh, I'll, I'll say that Hudson's got the digital version of my Crash Course for Success book. Thank you guys so much. Um, it's been selling like cardboard, but I mean, it's an older book now. You know what I mean? Well, what you know you what? Do? The, the thing is, like, I would recommend everybody check out the book. It's like you we're redoing the book, the bookstore. And for those who haven't checked out the digital platform, I, I'm not lying when I practice now, 99% of the time I have, to, I bought an iPad Pro, so the screen is a full size page. Sure. You, you just open the page and you press the button and the, the audio plays. Like I've been, you know, so, and, and then you can have your book, yeah. the, the books that are just, you want to read side by side with your drum books. You could also have your, uh, your beginner drum book that you published Modern Drummer. You could have that up in there. Uh, so it's, it's it's a Hudson portal where you can pull up all the offerings. Yeah, so the the Hudson Music Digital Bookstore to be clear, it's not just our books. We also have licensed stick control, syncopation, the Gary Chafee patterns, Afro Cuban rhythms for drums, every freaking classic book is in there and it's all there. And here's what I was getting at when I said press the button and play it. Like it seems obvious, but I've been polling my students, you know, like most of the printed books now they come with a code so you can access the material. Even the one step of going on HalLeonard.com and accessing the audio, I'm like, hey, did you listen to the audio for the Breakbeat Bible or the Afro-Cuban book that we're shedding? They're like, oh, no. It's like, you, like come on, man. Like, it, like everything is in a reading lesson and you're learning Latin grooves. You got to listen to them, you know? Yeah, listen to the music that you're learning the grooves from. Yeah. Yeah, so, so with the digital platform, the Hudson Music app, it's right there. You're, you're shedding... Rock steady in the breakbeat Bible. Boom! You press the button and you play it. That's cool. You know, or if you're working on Groove Essentials or our buddy Jim Riley's Survival Guide, you you can just play the you can play the examples and then you can play along to the track right in there. So it's it's definitely picking up and um right yeah and to think that Rob started this 
educational landslide in 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 the early '80s with Steve Gadd up close, right? It was a VHS, yeah, him sitting awkwardly. I hate. It's funny. He's sitting two feet from Gadd. Will you play that again for us? And he's <laughs> grown, he's grown it into this behemoth that it is. Incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Visionary. Yeah. Um. It's funny because Rob and Paul Siegel, who started the company with him, yeah. they they owned Drummers Collective in New York. That's right. Drummer. Yeah, and um and they bought it like they're both in their twenties and they they knew nothing about they weren't you know I I often say and I, I wonder if you agree with this I, I often say that um, school doesn't really do a good job of finding entrepreneurial talent. No, it doesn't prepare you either. You know, and it's I I had one brilliant professor one time i had a sight screaming test in the morning and but king's x was coming through and and that my teacher said don't let school get in the way of your education that's that's attributed to mark twain that quote <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see you're a voracious reader and i thought it was one of my professors it was mark <laughs> twain he may have stolen that one i think he stole um, it yeah i mean um what we uh, oh, yeah. what, where I was yeah. going with that was like Entre entrepreneurs. Yeah. So Rob, Rob, and Paul, you know, back then they had a thing. I here's what I here's an analogy I use. Like, if I think of a couple of the guys I went to high school with, uh, you know, one guy became um, a plumber. You know, let's say two guys became plumbers, right? Um, I know a guy, you know, who's in my he lives in my town. He's a plumber. You know. And he went to trade school and he learned the trade and it's a great job. It's a terrific job. You're fixing stuff. You have a working knowledge of science, you know, you're doing a trade, but this guy and everybody can relate to this. Certain guys become a plumber and then they're like, Oh, wait, I'm going to grow this thing, man. I don't, I don't want to be under the sink. I'm going to hire a couple of guys out of school. And then, no, and then, then, I, and then he bought another truck and then he bought another truck and then he bought the building and then he bought the supply. And now, and now the guy owns like a conglomerate, this dude, had entrepreneurial talent that was a seed like you don't you know what i'm saying like and 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 when you hang out a shingle to say that you give drum lessons or when you when you put yourself forward as an independent contractor as a, as a freelance musician to play gigs or you publish a book about drumming guess what you're an entrepreneur whether you like it or not yes, you're an you entrepreneur. Are. you know yeah. and um and with the Sabian Education Network, which is a whole other thing that I, I run, which you've been a guest for yeah, us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And it's so it's so incredible because I'm a massive believer in music education as as you are, and and education is a really wonderful marketing tool for musical products. And you guys have taken it a step further, where you're saying, "Hey, let's bring the educators that play Sabian cymbals together as a community." Right. Great. Like today, like today we had a session. They're, they're like members only sessions on Zoom. And the session was about new new ideas for recruiting new students. Like we don't we talk about curriculum. We talk about playing drums and I have guests. But really, the things that draw the most of our members is when like S Sabian Education Network is like a, for lack of better words, a club for drum teachers. You don't have to be a Sabian player to join it. It's the website is SabianEd.com. You sign up. You put in some demographics about how many students you have and whatnot, and you get approved. And, um, you know, back in the day, can you remember like when, you know, you and I would go to like our first PASIC when we were coming up and like you'd meet some other cats from like, you know, guys and gals like, oh, here's like, you know, you know, Sherry from Pennsylvania and here's, here's, uh, you know, Rich from Nashville and here's, you know, and you just met him and you're at the bar, like introduced by friends. And you're like, oh yeah, man, you're teaching a lot. Cool. Like what book do you use for jazz? Like I, I need a better jazz. Oh, this new book. Uh, by John Riley's really cool. Like, man, man, a lot of people are canceling. Like, what do you do when people can't? Like, you can't. Do you do you charge? Like, no, I charge it. You know, and you're talking about all this stuff, and you're like hanging and networking and learning. And SCN Saving Edu Education Network takes that. Like, my vision of it is it's that, but organized for the modern times. It's like on Zoom, a library behind the gate of the website. So we had a session today about you know, student recruitment and my presenters, you know, were Jim Toscano and Jim Royal. They're like talking about these amazing ideas about like, it's, it's, it's really like, there's some really fine tuned people making livings, giving drum lessons and playing locally. And they're like, awesome. And they, and like, it, it's just super cool to be, to see that and be part of it. It's the stuff I didn't know you could do when I was a kid. And, and Dom was, whenever we do saving education, 
the education network and we do those things like there's i always feel like there's an empty chair like my brother you know like i miss him uh, so much he was part of the whole reason i'm that doing that gig if without him I wouldn't. you guys are were you know he was your he, he was your mentor but you had a, a an underlying friendship was 30 years yeah i met him when i was 19 he was 36 yeah and he's my drum teacher and it was like he had this way of making everybody feel like special and like, you know, like if you were with him at the NAMM show, he'd be like, Joby, let's go get, get a sandwich. We couldn't, I would give up. We would try to walk, a, you know, 50 yards to the, to you, you couldn't make it. You couldn't make it. You would get stopped every, and he, and he was like, when he would talk to somebody, other people would be waiting to talk to him and he would just continue to look, you know, at the, at that person. That's and, a great um, lesson right there. Great. Wow. It, you and I, we both been in places where like you're talking to somebody like they're scanning the room like while they're talking to you like I know it's, it's I, I, if someone if, if I'm I'm rarely on the receiving end of that anymore but if I am I it, I end it I just walk away like I'm not you know I'm not good for you buddy well that's yeah. the thing that's the thing is I feel like that's almost human nature um but you have to fight it you have to fight that you have to make a conscious effort to make sure that the person that you're talking to is getting a hundred percent of your attention. Yeah. And, and, and when you're, when you're at a place like PASIC or your place like NAM and you're networking or whatever, like, I don't mean this to sound like I'm on a soapbox or I'm, I'm on a high horse of any kind, but like my, my whole career has been built on real relationships. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not in there just trying to find out who's the most powerful cat in the room that I can go and schmooze. That's bullshit. Like yeah. I'm not like, I'm, it, when you when you build true friendships and true relationships in the business, they. I mean, I don't do it for any other reason that I just, like when I come to Nashville, I I like you and I want. Yeah, we hang. We always make it a point I respect to respect you, and I'm like, we, man, who would I want to have a cup of coffee with in Nashville today? I think Rich, because like I enjoy his company and I admire him, and I, and then we okay. hang out, and then you know what I mean. And it's like, and that's where like when I talk about these like other jobs I got offered whether it's the ones I took or the ones I didn't, right. that's what they were born out of. They were, there was no, there was no like. This, this is not a printed resume business. You know what I mean? Yes. Your resume is considered, Hey dude, play with weather report. I think he can handle the gig. You know what I mean? That kind of a thing where your reputation precedes you. And there's a little understanding of kind of where you are in this industry and who you've played with. But you know, it's not like a business convention where people are walking around with printed resumes. You know, you, you know, you and I, you and I are both in the business of giving a lot of younger people advice. Yeah. Um, what do you, do you think, do you think like, I still think like Nam and Pasek are, are good for younger players to go and, and do like, I know Nam's not what it was, but do, do you, don't you think it's, I still tell them go, go get the Nam Thrax. You can count on it. You're going to get it every time, but it's just a badge of honor. You go there. Um, that's where you put names with faces and you can create relationships. And yeah, you got to fly to Orange County and you got to probably rent a car and you got to pay for these overpriced hotel rooms and you got to buy $10 cups of coffee, but it's just the price of admission. And then you could really, you could literally change your life, especially in the, you know, in the later part of your career, like ours, it's kind of like maintenance and you go and you, you hobnob and you want to make sure that you run into people that you wouldn't otherwise see and everybody gets their hug. It's a hug-a-thon. But in the early part of your career when you're like, hey, I, I'd like to talk to the guys at Remo and let them know that I'm playing a hundred shows a year. Maybe they, they'll invest in me or something. You, you really can. That's a perfect time to go to NAM and it, like in the early parts of your career. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, think, I think PASIC like Percussive Art Society or International Convention, for those who may not know of it, um, it's held in uh, November and it's usually in Indianapolis because that's where the organization PAS yes. is headquartered. <clears throat> um, it's kind of like it's like our it's like our professional continuing education conference. And while I totally what you said agree, there's a maintenance factor. There's there's also a cool like, you know. I mean, I know you've presented at PASIC. I've been able to present a couple of times. Yeah. There's a cool, like, I still find like challenges for growth. Or, like, I'll give you an example. So I'm, I'm, I have this website now, workingdrummercharts.com. It's oh god, I love it. I think you're brilliant. I'm gonna <laughs> copy it. Well, well, I'll talk about that in a second. But like, <laughs> I started, I started like real, like I got back into using Finale. 
And I put the charts in Finale real quick. And Finale is owned by the same company that owns Alfred. And then, yeah. and, so, and so there's like, oh, wow, I like doing, this is like kind of, uh, what's what's the word? Like, it's just a good coincidence. Like they, so here I am doing books for them, but I'm using the software. And and so then they had me on as a host to, for a seminar. And like, that that's something a lot of drummers are interested in because everybody has a website and they want to have their handouts and their stuff when they're scrolling, when they're doing their Instagram best solo anybody ever heard, you know? Um, and so th like that, I don't know. You go, you go to these things. I just, you, you sort of like don't know what's going to come, but I, I just know I wouldn't be doing the things that I'm doing if I, if I wasn't there. I love getting the inspiration, the shot of inspiration where you go to the big room 500 and Mike Mangini is blowing polyrhythms for an hour. Or you go earlier in the day and Matt Chamberlain is, you know, playing to tracks or blowing over vamps. And, and then even some of the smaller rooms where people are doing kind of like, historical reviews or like research papers and all the panel it's a love fest man it's incredible I, I, you know it's it's just something that i have to go to if you know i just make myself available i love it yeah you i, I always admired there's certain guys and you're you're one of them that i noticed look that like me you know look if, if if jason was out on the road you'd probably miss it if i you know this year the, my group has shows i got to figure it out like you got to you got to balance it because you you know obviously if you're a working player but i you're you're one of those guys like jim riley's another guy i could name a lot toscano you know people just like it's an it's an investment in yourself and by the way you know if you do this for a living you just write it off you know but it's, a, it's an investment in yourself and you know you can only make so many things happen sitting in your basement now you can do a lot more now because everybody's you know you have to cultivate your social media it's part of your brand you have to do that but isn't it exhausting man sometimes so i had a friend the other day who's like are you still doing instagram and i was like yeah i just i haven't been posting posts i've been doing stories stories for whatever reason right now with the algorithm they're just way more effective like there's more eyes on them for some reason my numbers have been poop on my just on the the posts right so i just took a break from it um that's a that's a weird you know every company in the world that makes everything everybody who wants to sell anything or have anybody know about anything like you have to go on there and there's a whole there's industries now where they're telling companies how the algorithm works and pay us and we'll get you this we'll get you that and it's like it it all seems very like and by the way, you're not dealing with a static entity that's controlling the algorithm. You're dealing with Meta and you're dealing with Instagram. Like they're manipulating it for their own purposes, right? Okay. So, so, so all what I try to do, and you don't have to take my advice. I don't have a bazillion followers. Like you just like, you know, I have this website right right now. Like I'm trying to promote this working drummer charts thing. The premise is I have like 500 charts in the can or so that I've written for club dates. I played them on the gigs and I'm throwing them into finale. I'm like, you know what? Why well, just make a little repository of them? Cause I've seen so many friggin' bad ones that are wrong, like on free websites where like, it's a transcription of Billy Jean with like a hundred measures of the beat, no song form. No, not like you don't need that on a club date. You need a high level roadmap that's written by, you know, like, so anyway, I'm trying to promote that. Do I want to seem like I'm a salesman all the time? No, but, I just try to mix in like my personality. Like I'm into playing drums. I like playing drums. I have fun and I do it. And maybe you post I, other things like, you know, riding your bike or having a glass of wine. Yeah. That's good too. You and know? I, look, I mean, maybe I definitely noticed that there's a lot of our really successful uh, peers on their social media feed. They never put anything except the drums and music. And that's an approach. Mm hmm. Maybe it's more effective. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's more effective. I, I've, I've experimented with all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all, all that to say, it's, it, you know, you, there's, there's definitely the darker side of it that you could talk about, but there's also a nice aspect to it that like, wow, like some guy bought my book and he lives in California and I live in New Jersey and he really found it helpful. And now he wants to take a lesson with me and I, and my lovely room here that's hooked up on Zoom with my one gig connection, I can teach drum lessons to anybody. Like my little student in Japan who goes into school late, she takes a lesson at 7 a.m. her time, 7 p.m. my time. She's in Japan. And Amazing. she found some music. And so, 
So there's a there's a nice power to it. Where- there is a nice power to it. I, I feel like my work comes from all my work comes from LinkedIn. It comes from Facebook. It comes from YouTube. It comes from Instagram DMs. It comes from me doing clinics. It making appearances at PASIC, playing live with Jason. You just never know where the person's interest is going to come from or how they stumble across you. So you almost have to be represented on all those things, which you know becomes quite exhausting. But um, but it, there always is that payday, which is like, hey, th- this just does seem to be working better than not doing it. Yeah. You know, and we, you have the whole other like world of public speaking that you have to promote yourself in two separate worlds, right? Yeah, like, people let it like the drummers don't get that. Like they won't give me love on a lot of the speaking stuff. They just, you know, they, it's just just like, what? You're a drummer, you know what I mean? So you, it's a weird. It, it could be a little bit weird there. Um, but it, it everybody should just jump in the deep end of the pool and 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 have that be part of their you know their music culture. It's just what we have to do nowadays. But hey, what about this duo project? Tell me about that. The how it happened, who the guys are. I know you're on some of the recordings, if not all the recordings. You guys are playing some great venues. The probably the catering is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I gotta watch out not overeating in the in the green room on the gig. Um, you gotta watch those M and M's, man. M and M's and the and the and the tortilla chips, the M and M's. It's they, you, in, yeah, in our dream <laughs> room, we're like you know, leave the symbol bag, take the cannoli. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, so um, so I start. I met. It's funny. All of the I talked about the stresses of subbing on Broadway, but I'm doing a whole bunch of really fun, cool gigs right now, and they all came mostly from people I met doing Broadway. Like I met great musicians in New York City. Um, so. The Duop Project is, the reason I'm doing it is the musical director, Sonny Palladino, um, hired me. The original drummer is Clint DeGannon. Great yeah, I've heard that name a million times. Clint, Clint's one of the best drummers in the world. Um, made his whole living in New York, so as a result, he's maybe not as well known as some other guys. But uh, He, just, he just work. kicks around, uh, he's kicked around New York doing all sorts of gig in that city since day one. Yeah, and he's played a whole bunch of Broadway shows where he was, he's like the busiest drummer in New York, done a million records. I'll give you one credit just to, to show you his pedigree. When Gad got too busy to be in stuff, he replaced Gad in stuff and played with Chris Parker. Like he's, he's, he's heavy. Uh, I subbed for him on a couple of Broadway shows and then he had the do project gig. And then he, I started doing it as a sub for him. Then he got too busy and then I became their regular drummer. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and Sonny Palladino, the musical director, who's currently the musical director of A Beautiful Noise on Broadway, he's like a, become a real um, successful musical director for Broadway shows. He's done stuff at the Kennedy Center. Uh, he's a, like, we're like super, he's like brother, love the guy. Um, <clears throat> everyone in the band, he's the musical director and one of the owners. The singers are five singers who met doing the show Jersey Boys. Uh, which I also played as, as a sub for 10 years on Broadway. But Sonny's the one who uh, brought me in to the duo project. I played uh, as a sub with him at a revival of Jesus Christ Superstar and then the really successful revival of Pippin on Broadway, which he was one of the conductors. And uh, and yeah, so he so everybody in the band serves at his pleasure. He's the MD, he's a piano player. Um, yeah, and I joined the band. We do somewhere between 50 to 100 dates a year we tour all over the u.s we go we go to canada we've been to china um one of the coolest things is we have a symphony show so i've played with you know some of the probably 20 of the biggest symphonies in america which is really crazy you got to play really quiet you got to interface with a conductor and an orchestra that plays like way behind the baton you know yeah Yeah, what's the what's the trick there because i've done some pop pop symphony dates and it's like i would acknowledge the conductor but then realize that hey i'm driving this ship man because I, yeah. I we were like a self-contained band it was like with pam tillis and we did like pop dates so the guys on guitar and bass and piano they want to hear the normal stuff pam yeah. wants it to she wanted it to feel normal just because we're adding the strings so it was it's just interesting balancing act of yeah so so the, the my my experience with it is the do project brings me to these places. They could hire a local drummer, but they bring me because my marching orders are play the show, make the boys feel like it's our normal show. So, and the conductor we're working with always knows that that's why I'm there. Like I know the tempos. And, and, and so most of the time they're, they're thankful for that because they know me and Sonny have played it a thousand times. So, 
you know, but there are some places in the show where it's a symphonic piece. And when you're the, when you're the drummer in a pops concert, you, the orchestra is going to usually follow you, but when you're working with a, you know, a pops conductor, some of them are very, you know, they're the conductor. Like you can't just come in. Like when I'm working with Jack Everly and he adds a couple of pieces to the show, Jack's one of the most, he's the guy who conducts a capital fourth, you know, on TV, you know, when Jack, he's added pieces to the show and, you know, I happen to be there. I have to play it. Jack wants me to be with him, quote unquote, you know, now the orchestra. So I know people are not being able to see this. So so it's a, the stuff you have to learn on the job when you do working gigs like this, like if you, if you watch a lot of Instagram drummers, you can be the best push pull, one handed roll, polyrhythm. Oh, playing a doo wop gig is easy. You'll crash and burn on my gig so fast you won't even know what hit you. Like when you sit in front of a conductor and he brings his baton down and his baton's here and you don't hear it, you hear the, here's my hi hat. You hear the baton comes down there. First of all, you got to know how to follow a conductor. You have to know what I'm talking about. Yes. The baton comes down and then you hear the orchestra there, like oh. almost later right and then you have to somehow figure out how to bring it all together and make it groove when the strings don't want to play and make sound until the concert master's bow moves because of the politics and the orchestra they can't play before the con you know so i'm like you're watching and you're trying to make it land if you if you if you're a little nervous and you play like you know if they, like if you're playing a gig where you're edging the click because you're a little nervous and it's on click you probably could survive even if it doesn't feel great to the band because the click is keeping everything in check if you do that with the orchestra it will not be together and the conductor will stop if it's rehearsal and it will be because of you <laughs> you do not want that okay yeah you know so so, so uh, what's the key is wait is wait <laughs> yeah so uh, what i do on those parts is i i just try to land i just try to make the entrance be far enough below where the bottom of the motion is so that when the orchestra comes in i'm i'm on the downbeat with them and then once you establish the groove they usually lock to you as long as you get that first note yeah and then and then if your tempo is where the conductor wants it if they're controlling it we, we have a couple pieces always in the doo-wop show where, where it's like that, then you do have to be able to parse where their tempo is and make sure it's, it's comfortable. If, if you're, if you're the, I always say when you're, when you're subbing a show or when you're working with a conductor and orchestral thing, it's like you have to do what they are envisioning and make it sound like it was all your idea. Totally. I agree. So that's the gig. Amazing. Yeah, I wonder like if like, you know, because I had Neil Grover on the show and all those years in the Boston Pops and he was talking about Fred Buda, you know, the, the, the great sing, sing, sing style drummer that played with the Boston Pops. I wonder if John Williams just kind of like he seemed like John seems like he's like a kind of a hip cat where he'd be like, follow Fred. You know what I mean? It's like it's like, you know what I mean? It's like what starts and stops with the him. But yeah. once you yeah. get a kick butt drummer in there. Yes. And they, and you know, the thing is like, here's, so, here's a great piece of news. Like we're really important. The, 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 you know, it took a while for Sonny to convince Jack Everly to let me come on a symphony gig. He has his own drummer. Who's great. Like, because we can tank it just like I said before. So like, who's playing drums? Like I've got to be comfortable and confident that this guy's my metronome. We're like a team, you know, John, John Morris Russell is a wonderful guy. He conducts the Cincinnati, uh, Symphony Orchestra and Cincinnati Pops. Yeah, he's like me and you, but we're like peas and carrots. You know, like you want to bond with that guy. Like I, my like I want him to be comfortable. I look at it like like I'm nervous because I want him to be comfortable. You know, oh. like so so yeah. The, I I would think that a guy like John Williams, you know, yeah, he must have like Clint uh, Clint, who I mentioned before, uh, the New York Pops conductor Steve Ronicky. Like he brings Clint every time because he knows that he can trust Clint, and Clint's gonna. Uh, we all, all the people who are groove drummers know that there's that issue with the orchestra, but all these orchestras, like when I come in and do the duop show, they, they, they like get the lay of the land. They're like, Oh, I get it. Like this drummer, this drummer's in the middle. He knows the gig. This is just going to groove. We're going to groove with, groove with him. And then the nicest thing I can hear, like most of the time we leave, like 
I usually say hi to the orchestra players between shows, whatever. And they're like, sure, yeah. Oh, and, you know, they, they oftentimes they'll say to me, you know, you're really easy to play with. Thank you. And I'm like, oh my god, that is like the nicest thing you could possibly say to me. Like that's, you know, like, you know, when you're grow growing up and you're trying to play rush songs, you don't realize like how heavy that is to hear that from people. That's like yeah. that's that's everything. You know, if the other people aren't comfortable with you when you're playing your groove, no one cares about anything else. Right. They don't care. And the Duo Project gig, there's really no pyrotechnics in it. It's all the all the challenges, all the other musical content, making the boys happy, making the MD happy, making the groove feel right, yeah. making the dynamics right between the rock show and the symphony show, you know, all the stuff that never gets talked about in a drum clinic, you know? Yeah. So I'm... Now, I'm yeah, that's, I'm just like, I, I like love, I'm just so, it's funny because like there's guys I know on Broadway who like, they have no idea of the other world I live in writing drum books. Like now a lot of them do because I've written with Gad and, you know, and then there's other people I play with and they're like, oh, you, you know, you do this like writing thing? What's that all about? Like, it's so funny. It's like, I'm, I'm like a two different dudes or something. I don't know. You are like you, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, it's it, you, so you're talking about in your formative years coming up. And of course your first major influence was, was Neil. Um, did you, did you go through a jazz phase where you're like Elvin Philly, you know? Um, you know, I, I, uh, I did. And I listened to a lot of jazz, but with a lot of fusion and a lot of funk after high school, I had a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. So I, I did, I did go through periods where, um, I, I have to say I'm still a student of some of the jazz players where I should know them better. But I went through a, a Tony period, you know, for sure. Um, and and then just kind of skipped around. I studied with John Riley, and so some of the drummers he would talk about, I spent time on, you know, Max and Papa Joe. Yeah. Um, I Guys like Roy Haynes, yes, I've listened to a ton of him. Elvin, I've listened to a ton of him. I would never in a million years say I'm any kind of an expert on them. Um, yeah, but well, me either. You know. Yeah, like interestingly, I still, when I'm not learning music for gigs, I, I, you know, I've been pretty good, especially since the pandemic. Like I, I still enjoy practicing and learning new things to add to my, you know, just to my knowledge, but also so I can be a better teacher, you know, make sure yeah. I'm doing a good job preparing my students for their careers and their lives, you know. So, um, I find that interestingly, I really gravitate towards jazz and Afro-Cuban music in my practice. Uh, I, I, I tend to like working on, well, for one thing, expanding my knowledge of the styles and I'll practice stuff and then I'll, especially John Riley's books, because he's always got context, like his new book, The Master Drummer, which is, was a DVD. The solo section is like all taken from Roy and Art Blakey and Max, and you can practice the stuff and then go to the recordings and hear how it was deployed, you know? Um, but I also, I'm, I don't, I find working on independence more compelling in the presence of musical context. So like working on five with my hand and six with my feet in the abstract, I'm in no way, shape or form saying I can do it. I don't find it super compelling to work on. I'd rather work on a Wah Wah Co thing with some crazy independence that I can't do yet. Yeah. And, and. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just saying that gets me in the practice room. That's what I did. Totally, totally. And I'm just sitting here. I've, I've been staring at the three toms on your kit, the three mounted toms. It's so melodic. It, it, at some point, I do want to have three up top and two two down. Because, you know, my yeah. band, my band, like, I don't even know if they have the toms in the mix. I have no idea. But I think it gets in the way. <laughs> you know, like my bass player, I think it gets in the way. of You know, as long as I hear that kick and snare cranked up like a Prince record, you know, but that, but to have the, I just want to get on those toms right now and just go. Do -do 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 <laughs> you know, Sonny, who I talked about before, is like, he's like, if I if I brought no toms, he'd be happy. He's like, don't play the toms, f the toms. We don't. And 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 all the guys I love, like my other heroes, Simon Phillips and Billy Cobham. It's like a lot of toms. I just had Matt Fournette on the show. You know, from Loverboy, he's got oh, that yeah, three up top. Or uh, I don't. You got two on the bottom. Even one on the bottom is fine. You know. I, I and you know on the gigs I'm doing now, I never get to use this. When I when I I still do a fair amount of work with people I met doing moving out. So I you know, Michael Cavanaugh, and Matt Friedman, and Wade Press. You know, guys who do Billy stuff. So you had um, to be a student of of Lib even more. I, Lib was always one of my favorites. But a lot of you know Chuck Berge with with Billy's now. He's he's just using one rack. Lib takes a smaller kit. 
when I when I do any one of the the Billy tributes, you know, with some of the great guys I get to do it with, I always bring three racks because Liv had three back then. He did. He did. Oh my god! I just made, I just want to get on those things, man, and just start breaking up some stickings and stuff. Because I just I just don't I don't get to do it, you know. I, yeah. I got the one mounted Tom in front of me. Spaka doom, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I leave everything set up in here. I thought about scaling it back. Cause, well, here's what you can't see. I have my, this is like my, my prog setup from when I was in Happy the Man and the old prog bands. I have, I have a Tama, so check this out. So it's, I have a Tama Timp Tom. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. People can sit, want to see it. I'll the switch. Timp Tom, yeah, so. so. That's a Tom. Yeah. So I have, I have a Timp Tom. Oh, nice. And I have a 10 inch snare that doubles as my other, you know, you know, it's a 10 inch snare for the like side snare hip hop stuff. Beautiful. And then, uh, is Zoom muting my drums? No, no, it's, it's nice. They're coming through. And I have three racks and then two floors and I just leave it all set up even though most of what I'm playing now isn't, uh, that's insane. great, man. That's a great setup down there, brother. This this was the the smallest setup I could figure out when I was young to play every Rush songs and I and I've kept it. <laughs> I got to go back and hear some of your prog bands that you're in, man, because I heard one every time you said like, "Hey, if you really want to know how I really like to play drums, go check out these prog bands I was in." So there's a there's a I was in a band called Forefront. The main the composer in that band is a guitar player, Zach Rizvi. He's currently in the band Kansas. Ah, He's yeah, Kerry, yeah. It's Kerry Livgren in Kansas. Um, unfortunately, we lost touch, but he's one of the best musicians I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And um, our last album we did is called Malice in Wonderland. And um, it's the most thing I'm most proud of that I ever recorded. Uh, it's pretty pretty much basically the, the hardest music I could pull off in my whatever my skill set is, but it's definitely like not. It's melodic music. It's got like a rush dregs kansas dream theater vibe but zach was also into like abba and toto and nice Barry Manilow, like all great so it's 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 like melodic but anyway forefront's the band and the, and then i i was in the band happy the man who was like a kind of well-known art rock band in the 70s uh i joined in their reunion i'm on a record called uh the muse awakens which i'm very proud of and we toured a little bit we recorded those shows and i'm really hoping they see the light of day i i've been with the stuff i'm doing now is listen if i listen back to those live tapes i'm like that was me like i can't do that <laughs> who was that <laughs> you know? it's always like another lifetime ago well it's, i will i will definitely check those things out man and how's your son doing he's studying music right oh man thank you for asking rich yeah my son nick just graduated college he already um, graduated the last time i talked to you he was deciding on what college to go to I know he he graduated two days ago and holy cow i know pressure of mine he decided he wants to do what we do he wants to be a drummer he went to school for music uh he went to new jersey city university the apple didn't really fall far here he stayed close by uh he he, he teaches you know in my room here there's two kids he's got the room on saturdays he teaches in here um How he's cool. playing, a club, playing a club date tonight what's cool is some of my students like my student Dan Traglia, who I taught since he was ten, and now he's a pro and he subs for me. Dan has given Nick some club gate gigs. Like it's like so awesome, you know. But um, yeah, this business isn't getting any, any easier. But my son wants to do it. That's great. Like father, like son, man. That's I may mean, give him give him my best, please, and congratulations. And hopefully, you had a big graduation party. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a little party. He didn't want to have a party. Um, and my wife Kim was like, uh, you know, didn't want to have a party. What? She's like, tell you, Nicholas doesn't want to have parties. So I was like, I was like, Nicholas, man, we got to break into new grill. Have have Uncle Steve over, grill up some steaks, have a glass of vino, you know, do it for your old man. He's like, all right, pop, no problem, let's do it. <laughs> you know? Oh, it's so sweet. Now, is he your only child? No, I have a daughter. Her name is Jenna Rose, and she's uh, eighteen. She's nineteen now. She goes to the uh, University of Rhode Island, and she's okay. majoring in marketing. Um, not exactly sure of her career path. So, uh, yeah, so that's my little fam. My wife, Kim. My is your wife daughter. Italian? I, I don't think I met your wife. She's half Italian. Her, her maiden name is Zecker, um, but she, her mom is Italian. She's Italian now, Bergamini. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> she's a great cook, and she's my rock, and she's super awesome. Little known fact, she is a, well, she's a school music teacher, and she's a percussionist. And, I did um, not know that. 
Yeah, and one of the things she always says is like she knew what my dreams were, and the crazy schedule we have, whether you're on tour, whether you're subbing Broadway, whether you're leaving soccer practice to go sub for a show. She always says, I knew what I was signing up for. You know? Man, and how long have you kids been married? Um, we got married in 97, so what are we, 20 20- seven years are going on Good for you guys man and we were together for seven years before that so you know you get, if i was going to find somebody to put up with my crap for that long i gotta keep him <laughs> that's that is really amazing man congratulations hey let's close out with the uh, with the fave five what's your favorite color joe my favorite color oh my gosh uh red Red, I love it. Now, I like red. Look at my walls right there. Look at my logo. <laughs> nice. Red and black, red and black. What's your favorite um, drink? Red wine. Okay, so do, do you have like a, is it one of the th- of the three Italian bees, a Barolo, a Bar- Barbaresco, or what? do you have a region uh, you like? I, or? I, I like I like all reds. I definitely like, um, <laughs> I definitely like Valpicello, Valpicello Rapasso. Uh, and you know what? Uh, who was a big Valpicella drinker, Jeff that- Percaro. Oh, okay. Yeah, Percaro's oh, favorite. I know that from Robin Flans' book. Uh, and then if you if you keep going aging that grape, you get Amarone. I love Amarone. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but I, I, I like, you know, uh, Nebbiolo and Nero and just like a, a Tusc- super Tuscan. But it, like if we're having pizza, I'll just open like something lighter. And then I like California wines a lot. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, like I, I don't claim to know much. I, I know what I like. Like, I like Bogle wine. They're, like, super popular everywhere. I just happen to drink a lot of that every day. But, uh, yeah, like California Reds and probably probably could learn a little more about So that. a little bit every day, like a glass at the end of the day? No, 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 no. I was drinking a glass every day. But, um, unfortunately, we have a little uh, diabetes history in my family. And even though I'm a skinny guy, I, I, I can't. Wine just turns into sugar. So I try sure to cut does. It Yeah, it sure does. Interesting. So, a little bit less. A little bit less. A little bit less. Uh, moderation. Uh, what about your uh, favorite dish? You got a favorite dish, and do you cook a little bit? You, you got a favorite dish? I, I cook. Uh, my wife is an amazing cook, and we both love food. We both love to eat, cook it and eat out. Um, my favorite dish to eat. Oh my god! This, this is the problem when we get older, Rich. You can't. You're not. you the human body, especially us Americans. We eat too much food. We don't. Our body doesn't need it. Yeah. But I love to eat food. I love. I know. Well, okay. Um, I mean, I don't. I can't imagine a fit, like I. I know, like, I, I love simply a grilled steak with a glass of wine. I try not to eat it a lot because it's you can't eat a lot of red meat. But uh, I love wine and cheese. I love cacio e pepe, the four classic pastas of Rome. Ah. Uh, yeah, uh, I love sushi. Uh, I can't give you one. Sorry. All that sounds good. All that sounds oh, good. And, and, and actually, like. Usually for lunch, I have a salad with some balsamic vinegar and, and beans and some roasted red peppers. Try to eat healthy. I love that. But there's no protein on there. It be, well, the beans have protein. Oh, yeah, yeah beans. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incomplete protein. But hey, you know what are you gonna do? Yeah, sometimes I'll do I'll do tuna. I've been I've been trying to dial back the meat. Uh, you know, I, I love to eat whatever. I just try to balance it out. I'm on a thing where I'm just on paleo, dude. Just I I don't even care. I just eat the meat. You know. Yeah, you know, I mean. Uh, well, if you want to really, so I, I just had my physical. I, I try to, you know, have one every year. Have oh, my of blood course. Work. Like, yeah, I think if you, I think if you like, as you get older, like I'm in my fifties, you know, we're close to the same age. Like, oh yeah. I just look at the numbers in my blood work. I, I don't, I eat everything. Like I, I eat whole wheat grains. I eat pasta. I just watch my blood work and make sure things are in line and talk Love to my doctor. That's so are. smart. Just, yeah. I eat everything, but just try not to go. Over, you know. I eat everything, but not all at once. Hey, right. But uh, psh, hey, oh. this is a hard one. But what about uh, this is a song that just keeps coming in your life. It finds you. You either like the melody or you like the artist. Or you like the chord structure, but you can't escape it. It's one of your favorite songs. Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, always loved the song. Yeah. Uh, I get to play it a lot. I played it in different bands. It's sort of been sort of been around my musical life on a lot of gigs I do, it comes up and it, I guess it, yeah. Like some of those things like with Jeff, it has everything you let and Simon did it. Like it's got super deep groove, but, but you gotta have some drum chops to play it too. So what the heck is it about though? What is that song about? The lyrics are great. Is it a love song? Are they going to Africa? 
Uh, what I, I, that, that I don't know. I can remember really clearly many years ago, I was singing it in the car. My wife's like, as sure as, as sure as Kilimanjaro rises like Olympus above the Serengeti. <laughs> it was like, she's like, is that what he's saying? I'm like, yeah, it's so weird, you know? It, it is strange. And the you know, lyrics are. So Simon, you know, when Simon played it. He imitated the, the, that conga thing because there was no percussionist in Toto, and yeah. he did the cross stick kind of on the vibe of where the congas are. So, like when it comes up on the gig, I'm like, I think I heard Greg Bissonette talk about this. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play the Simon Simon's version because of, the, but then I play, you know, I'm gonna play when in the chorus Jeff was on the bell, and I'm gonna play Jeff's fills from the Toto Live in Paris from the from the Zini on the lead. Like going into the last chorus, you know, like I'm gonna, you know, it's like we're totally geeking out. It's like I'm, I'm choosing the I'm Simon. Gonna use, I'm gonna play Greg's chorus and and Simon's verse. Yeah, it's like it's like you know, Rosanna is probably a close second, and then and then, and then you know, the song that made me want to be a drummer is Subdivisions by Rush. Subdivisions. Not, I love the press roll. Yeah. You know, it wasn't quite a buzz. It was like a, a kind of open stroke. Like a, it's yeah, it's great. singles. It's singles. Yeah. Oh, those are singles? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. And now what about your favorite movie? You got a favorite movie? Favorite movie? A lot. I mean, I I was really into movies for a long time, but I, I'm, I'm not. Of, um, You're out. You're out of the phase. No, I mean, uh, I would say, again, a lot of favorites. 2001 Space Odyssey is a favorite. All right, Hal. Okay. I like the Cohn Brothers, but I haven't I haven't seen a lot of their current stuff, so I yeah, I really like that stuff. Um, yep. Yeah. And I like I like yeah. I would say 2001 is up there. The Shining is another one I like a lot. Man, when those two girls are at the end of the hallway, it's still spine tingling. Oh my god. That, that I think that's actually the most frightening movie I've seen. Two little girls. How could two girls hurt you? I mean, you know what I mean, but they—I just got chills. If you, if you, like, it's one of those things. Like, if you, there's going to be the scene where the kids ride in his tricycle and these two like ghostly girls appear. They're two little girls and they're standing in the hall. At the end of the hall. Like, yeah, you'd be like, "That's not, how's that scary?" And, and then what does he do? He backs up, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that that whole thing is just such a masterpiece. Now, when yeah. she comes out of the bathtub, that is really scary too. Yeah. Remember the old lady in, in the room? And of course, when I was a young man and I was looking for boobies, I was like, hey, this is great, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, when I first saw it, I was like, I was really upset about, uh, you know, like they're not going to get Scatman with the axe, are they? But yeah, you know. They got him. By the way, you have you ever seen this? Is, I don't know why I'm thinking of this. I just saw a YouTube thing of Scatman Crothers and, and um, Red Fox. Scatman was a guest on Sanford and Son. And 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 they sing, uh, you know. Red Fox could sing, you know. He's, he's yeah, inside. it's very very blue comedian. And and it was one of the greatest. Like I was on the floor at this line because it was like you know the great joke is like uh, so much wrapped up in the joke. So Scatman's like uh, you know uh, sitting in there, and he's like, well maybe maybe I'll play a song. And then Red Fox like. You know, or what's his son's name? Lamont. He's like, Lamont, Get me his yeah. guitar, dummy. and he gets his guitar, and he's like, and then he's like, well, he's like, oh, you know, Sanford, maybe we should do a song, you know? And Red Fox is like, oh no, man, I, you're too good. I don't want to all of me in A flat, you know? <laughs> it's like it's so funny, like the whole false modesty thing. But hey, man, back to sixteen inch crash cymbals. Uh, you so so yeah, your your uh, your uh, your other questions are great and. And uh, I love Bill Bruford calls life beyond the symbols. <laughs> life beyond the symbols. Um, and, and so what else do you do, man, for uh, like, you know, enjoyment away from the drums? A little well, wine. I used to ride my bike a lot until I yeah. and shattered my wrist. But um, ah. uh, like I said, I, I like to read. Um, I like spend time with the family. Um, sure. when, I'm, when I'm on the road with the band, we, we have a luxury of <clears throat> we travel, we fly out, we do a few days and we come back. Nice. And, um, I become a huge fan and visitor of the national parks, uh, not just the parks, but the historical sites. So I'll go like, like we have a gig in Dallas coming up. We're playing an uh, outdoor venue in Dallas. I'm going a day early, renting a car so I can knock off 
Waco Mammoth National Monument. <laughs> like I did to like 260 of the national park sites of like the 460 odd that they have. That's great, man. That's such a cool thing. That's my road hobby and the stuff you learn if you, if your mind is open. So I like that. I'm, I'm kind of into, um, bird watching, you know, I'll go out and hike and I'll go bird watching. I, <laughs> funny, Neil was into that too. You know, I, I so, like it. I mean, I have a very, um, wild backyard i mean i have like tons of mature trees 80 year old trees and i'll oh. sit on the deck and i listen these things are so loud and and basically what they're doing is uh, this is how i interpret it one of them sings a song and then the other one responds it's like it's like a dating app i think they're they're, they're all trying to hook up yeah and you know it's funny like um everything I, i'm always fascinated everything has a culture when i started riding the bike a lot it's like you know, you go in the bike shop and you're like, oh, I'll just use this app on my phone. And they're like, oh, and then my phone's dying. And they're like, no, no, you have to, you have to have this like, you know, bike computer, you know, I'm like, well, why can't I just use the app? And they're like, well, you could do that. But you know, when you really get into it, you know, then I'm like, well, why can't I just, you know, clip in with these shoes? Well, they're like trying to sell me the, you know, like ones that have better power transit. I'm like, well, I have these clips already. Why don't I just put the same clips on my other bike when I buy my road bike? You know, they're like, well, you could do that, but the real guys, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like bird watching is like a whole, like I'm, I'm, I'm into it enough. Like I bring my Merlin app, which is an identification app. And I like, I'll upload my um, lists into like eBird, which is, which is run by the Cornell lab of ornithology. And that's like citizen science. Like if I, if you identify a rare bird and you don't upload a photo, they'll literally flame you. Like there cannot be, uh, you know, a, a great egret at this time of year in this place. That was definitely not that. It was a white morph of a blue heron. And don't upload it again unless you're sure. And you're like, what? Like, oh my god! Like, that, well, yeah. you know, I was talking to Jack Bruno, the great drummer Jack Bruno, and you know, he lives down in Franklin, Tennessee, and we're, we get together, like, try to get together once a year and have a martini. And, and I was like, man, I'm into birds, man. I listen to their such they're beautiful, the way they sing and everything. He's like, you know what? I got the app. I hold it up, and it'll tell you what bird that, it that's is. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, but what? So I'll, I'll do, you know, like if we're on the road, like if we're in Florida for two weeks, we'll, cause we go down there a lot, like, you know, I'll find like a, either a city park or wildlife refuge, go walk outside. And um, yeah, so those are kind of the, the things, you know, my wife and I like to go out to eat when I'm home, but uh, I, it took me until I was probably about, I don't know, maybe in my mid thirties that I realized that my work eth ethic would probably kill most people. <laughs> I, I work a lot. Yeah, no, we, we both do, man. And sometimes I just, Want to watch Friends, man? You know, just like kick back, smoke a cigar, or go go for a walk. You know, you know yeah. just I'm 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 smelling the roses more often now in my fifties. You know, you know, I I was just goofing because I my, I hurt my wrist and I I um I've been I've been doing a little work on my deck. You know, and like I don't, like certain things like are zen to me. Like it's just such a simple like I'm gonna take this board off. I'm gonna cut this board and I'm gonna replace these boards and then like. And then you're going to finish it. And then I'm going to stand on this deck. I'm going to grill steak and drink a glass of wine with my wife on this freaking deck that I just rebuilt. Like, yeah, I, it's cool. I just, men, like, I, men, like, I, men, I, men. No, I mean, you know, it's well, a man I mean, thing. But I'm also saying I bird watch, which is the dorkiest thing. It's it, right, right. <laughs> Yeah. This is amazing. Hey, well, you know, hey, it's Friday night. It's almost six o'clock on the East Coast. I got to let you go. I got to let you do your thing. This is such a great time together. Great to, you know, do a deeper dive into your amazing career. You're doing so many things, drumming, educator, producer, you're a publisher, author of 15 books, you're touring, you're doing so many things, man. And you've already, you got another one and I got a son that's going to be carrying the torch. It's a really great thing. And is it the, uh, Joe Bergamini.com? Is that the hub for all yeah, things? Yeah, that's, okay. that's pretty much the reach out to Joe, join the, take a lesson from Joe Join the PAS. Come see us at the PAS. Join the SEN. You know, you'll be able to hang with Joe. It's it's a great, great thing. Thanks so much, man. Rich, thank you for having me. And and uh, thanks for your friendship. We've known each other quite a while now. And thank you. I admired not only your career, but your passion for what you do. And Likewise. it's really been, I'm not, I'm not lying. I, I really like, you know, enjoy your company and uh, I'm an Likewise. admirer and I'm always grateful to, you know, work with you in any way shape or form and definitely for saving education network i hope you'll you know come back and do something else for anytime for you need me man the, the the feeling is mutual man congratulations on an amazing career and you know we're still doing it man 
That's for sure, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, to all the listeners out there, thank you guys so much for listening. And if you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe. New episode drops every Friday. Share the episode. Review the episode. Leave me a five-star rating. If you don't want to give me a five-star rating, tell me why. I got an email address for you, Show at gmail.com. All right. This was a blast. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Joe. Take care, Rich. Thank you. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.